So hey guys and welcome back. I hope you're uh, enjoying Shark Week. And if I'd have planned better, we'd be doing an underwater camera right now. But I didn't. So we're not. So hello and welcome back. If you are new to this channel, what we talk about is mainly film photography and film photography cameras, a little bit of travel, and then some video photo stuff alongside. And basically kind of just whatever I feel like doing. So make sure you like this video. If you find it useful, comment down below and say hi and subscribe for future videos. And now let's get into the topic of today. The last little note is that I am wrapping up edits on my website for things that I'm going to sell. So we've got a lot of things, we've got different cameras, we've got accessories, we've got lenses, uh, straps, just all kinds of stuff. Some TLRs are gonna be coming pretty soon. So yeah, we're wrapping that up and I'm pretty sure that will be linked and set live when the next video goes up, which should be next Thursday if all goes right. I'm probably gonna do a few giveaways and I might have a few items listed at pretty good prices uh, just to kind of promote that and push that uh, just to give you guys kind of a heads up into that so you can get some good deals. Thinking about some shirts and maybe some other stuff like that, we'll see. Don't wanna get too crazy too quick. Now, the Konica 3 and the Konica 3A is the topic of conversation today. And this has quickly become my favorite rangefinder in the one roll of film that I have put through just the Konica 3 and haven't really put any film through the Konica 3A yet. But hey, it's still a great camera and uh, I'm still gonna go through it and kind of show you the pros, cons, and differences between these two, uh, which aren't a lot, uh, but there are some significant ones. And then of course, we'll be going over the 20 point rating system, which is of course usability, uh, image quality, build quality, and then features of these cameras. So let's get right into it. The Konica 3 first started produced in 1956. Now before the Konica 3, there was the Konica A, or the Konica 1, uh, then there was the Konica 2, then there's the Konica 3, and then there's the Konica 3A. The Konica 1 and the Konica 2 uh, are still decent cameras, but the features are less. Uh, it was a knob to advance the film, which is kind of annoying, as opposed to what these kind of have installed for them. Now, no, I do not own both of these cameras. Uh, thank you for assuming the worst of me. Uh, I bought the Konica 3A about a month ago, and then a guy by the name of Josh Yang reached out to me on Instagram talking about some issues he had with his Konica 3. Uh, if you wanna see some great quality portraits, I highly suggest you check out a fellow photographer, Jay Yang Photo on Instagram. Uh, great stuff, uh, extremely underrated, so go support another underrated photographer. Check out Jay Yang photo on Instagram. Anyways, so he sent this to me uh, saying there was an issue with the lens element and then the shutter wasn't working. So I managed to take it apart and after removing some sort of glue or adhesive from the lens element uh, and then also fixing the shutter, the Konica 3 was up and running and I put a test throw through it and she's working great. So after this video, the Konica 3 will be shipping back to him. So first let's go over usability. And these are not by any means the easiest cameras to use. The Konica 3 and Konica 3A are double stroke cameras, meaning to advance the film and cock the shutter, you have to click the film advance twice before you can fire the shutter. Now again, remember these were built around 1956 to about 1960. For reference, this is the same time the Leica M3 was built and produced if I'm not mistaken. The Leica M3 is also a two-stroke camera. These do not take batteries and there is no internal light meter. These are leaf shutters, so they go up to one over 500th of a second and all the way down to a bulb move or a one second exposure. Aperture wise, uh, they vary a little bit, which we'll get into further detail later, but uh, F2 to 22 and F1.8 to 22 for the Konica 3A. Size wise, as you can see, they're very compact. They're great, they really did put a lot of high quality build into a very small compact body and everything is kind of neatly tucked into where it is. I will say as far as size wise, I'm noticing that for the two stroke, the camera strap on my 3A gets in the way a bit of that two stroke, which is kind of annoying. Uh, and I'm hoping that's not too big of an issue. Otherwise I might have to figure something else out. Another big thing with the Konica 3 and Konica 3A is the EV metering. Well, you might be saying, what is EV metering? And you'd be right. So this 
is what you get for a meter for the Konica 3 or Konica 3A. Now this is just a little attachment light meter. It pops right onto the top of your camera. And this is what you'd use to get your light meter reading. So this cool little window just kind of pops out there. It's kind of neat. And on the top, you select your ISO. And then over here, it's gonna give you a number. That number, you're going to plug in to the camera. There's a black ring on the front of the camera. And so that is where you're gonna plug in the number to correlate to your EV meter. Now these cameras have coupled settings. Well, what does that mean? As you adjust the EV meter, it is going to automatically adjust your aperture and shutter speed according to that number you plug in. That is how it's going to tell you the proper exposure settings to make sure that your image is properly exposed, which is great. Uh, and back then that was a big deal because you didn't have to worry about changing your settings or anything like that. You just plug in the number off the meter and your settings were fine. Back then they weren't worried about swirly bokeh or anything like that. So it was very simple, straightforward, and it was what you needed to do to get the proper image. And that's all that mattered. So for the time, that was a great feature and people loved it. Now, everyone hates it, at least the vast majority of you do. And if you're like me, I removed that coupling meter on both of these cameras. So now I can freely change my aperture and shutter speed independently without having to have them automatically correlate. You can kind of depress that black ring and turn it to adjust your settings a little bit more. Uh, I can't really show you because I took the meters out of these. It's pretty simple, straightforward. It's just a little prong that you take out of the inner side of the camera. I wouldn't do it though, unless you know what you're doing. Um, but a lot of these are actually gonna have that already removed because most people don't like being forced into that kind of limitation. Ugh, I feel like that's pretty relevant right now. Ugh. Now for focusing, they do have patches on the inside and it is a rangefinder focusing. So there is a knob here, which is substantial enough. Uh, the patch on the viewfinder is also great and it's very easy to kind of pick out your focus. Changing your settings, however, is not as easy. Uh, there is the black ring, which has some grip to it where you can adjust your aperture. And then also on the element further up where you adjust your shutter speed, there's also a little grip spot too. So you can kind of tell the difference, uh, but it is not going to be as easy easy as say changing your aperture on a SLR. And it probably will take just a little bit of getting used to uh, before you're comfortable changing those two settings. So with regards to the viewfinder and focusing, that's where the big difference comes in between the 3 and the 3A. So with the Konica 3, you have your standard focus patch in the center, and then you have your frame lines giving you what your frame is. And it also has the hash marks further in for what your closest focus is gonna be for that parallax correction. The parallax correction, of course, is because your viewfinder is over here and your lens is centered. So you have to compensate for that as your subject is closer to the lens in order to make sure your subject is, of course, still centered. So it's nice, it does give you those hash marks, uh, but you can clearly see between these two cameras that the viewfinder and focusing screen is gonna be vastly different. Now, with the Konica 3A, as you look through the viewfinder, it is substantially bigger and brighter, and uh, this is really where the 3A sets itself apart from the 3. Uh, you have your focus patch in the center, but your frame lines are on the outside. They're dashed, uh, they're almost lit up as you look through it. And as you focus closer and closer, those frame lines move in. So it is correcting the parallax for you automatically as you adjust your focus, which is great. So you don't have to guess as far as what your frame is gonna be between that infinity and that three foot range that your focus is, it is going to automatically adjust it accordingly for you so you can focus more on taking the shot. Uh, and honestly, I was quite surprised at how big the viewfinder difference was between the 3 and the 3A. Uh, so for comparison, you might be more familiar with uh, the Olympus 35 SP, which is a very popular rangefinder, does not give you parallax correction. Uh, it tells you what the full frame is and it has your hash marks, but something like the Canon QL uh, has automatic parallax correction, so you don't have to worry about it. So as far as usability goes, it's very straightforward, uh, easy to use if you understand what you're doing, uh, but because because it doesn't have all the advanced settings and all that kind of stuff and the kind of hassle and annoyance of using the coupling system if you don't know how to take it out or don't have one with that removed I'm gonna have to give usability a three uh, which pains me to say because I really do enjoy this camera if you know what you're doing and if you don't have to worry about the coupling 
Honestly, it's very easily a four plus, but for the intro kind of person, I'm gonna have to stick with a three. Build quality. Uh, these are post-World War II, obviously. They were built in the 50s. Now, post-World War II, Japan was really trying to cut down on any cost they could and make cameras as cheaply and effectively as they could. So usually what that means is that they would cut down on the thickness of the, uh, of the aluminum or brass bodies, uh, and they would cut down on the amount of chrome that they put on it. Uh, so chrome finishings would wear off really quickly and bodies would be dented very easily as well. Uh, and just the quality was very lacking because they were just doing whatever they could to build and produce cameras. That being said, these are built like tanks. Honestly, and using these and kind of looking through them, the first thing that I would compare them to are the Nikon F and Nikon F2, which are some of my favorite cameras because of that build quality, that they're just gonna run forever and they're just built superbly. Or something like the Minolta SRT, cameras that were just built to last. The one fault of these cameras is that leaf shutter. If it sits too long, you know, it tends to get stuck up a little bit uh, and it will kind of seize and stop working. Both of these did have to have the shutter looked at just to kind of get rid of some gunk and clean it out a little bit. But once I did that, they're back up and running perfectly. And honestly, I think they'll continue to run for quite some time. So for build quality, I am gonna have to go with a five. Even with that little shutter issue, it's just a minor thing and it's nothing serious. Image quality. Now, as I said, this was produced around the same time as the Leica M3. And for some reason, people were comparing the Konica 3A to the Leica M3, I believe is the correct model. Don't quote me on that. Uh, because it is a two stroke, because it's a rangefinder, same time period. I mean, looking at it, it looks similar to, you know, an old Voigtlander, which is something I love. I just love the body style of this. It's very unique and specific. So the Konica 3 has a 48 millimeter F2 lens. The Konica 3A, the Japan version is a 48 millimeter F2 lens. The version they shipped out across the world was a 50 millimeter F1.8. The 50 millimeter is what I have here for the Konica 3A. Not a huge difference, just basically preference. So for image quality, Konica glass is great. These are fixed lens rangefinders, so you are limited to the lens on the body, but Konica glass is great, especially in these cameras. So between that and the parallax question and the awesome viewfinder in this Konica 3A, a, uh, which honestly is very similar to the Konica Auto S2, which is a huge viewfinder. Uh, and I think it's definitely better than the Yashica Electra, which I own as well. The viewfinder, this is definitely much brighter and easier to use, my opinion. So for image quality, I'm gonna have to go with a four. I would love to give it a five, but I'm not quite comfortable with that yet. Features. <laughs> well, there are none. Features wise, there really isn't much to these cameras. Again, built in the 50s, so it's very simple, straightforward. Uh, the EV metering, which is kind of difficult, the double stroke, uh, it does show you your frame count are right here. Uh, you have your film rewind, which is a little bit different on the 3 and the 3A. The 3A is a little bit nicer. It's kind of built into the body, uh, which I do like that it's not the traditional knob that you always see. To open the film back, it's a little bit different as well. You have this lever on the bottom that you twist and turn. And then once you do that, you just press it down and it pops open the film door. So that's nice to have. Uh, and I kind of prefer that over pulling up the film lever and everything. Uh, you do have a bulb mode. You do have timers look a little bit different on each camera. Another interesting feature is that on the actual shutter button, there usually is a little, well, not usually because most of them get lost. There's a little piece that screws into that, kind of like on modern flash sync ports where you have a little knob that kind of covers it up. They have the same thing for that screw port for the flash sync on the top here. They're missing on these cameras and they're very easy to lose, but that was there to kind of keep dust out and things like that. So that was another cool little feature. I'm going to have to go with your standard three again. Uh, and I hate to do that again because these really are great cameras, but that's just not what they were built for. I mean, you could technically go a little lower to a two, uh, but I don't think that's necessarily fair since if they were SLRs, they would have more of those features that you would normally see. So that's going to wrap up my thoughts on the Konica 3 and the Konica 3A. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. I highly recommend getting the Konica 3A if you know what you're doing and you're looking for a solid, a more affordable range finder compared to your expensive Leicas or Voigtlanders uh, and something that's a little unique unique and looks a little bit different and then you're not going to see everybody to carry around. So comment down below. Let me know what you think of the Konica 3A or the Konica 3. Make sure you subscribe for future videos and I will see you in the next one.